three minutes. That's not very long to live, is it? But there it is on that clock. All that's left of your rotten lifetime. Three minutes. If you pick up that telephone, you'll have only one minute. Operator? Operator? Hello? 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 Sorry, operator. I dropped the phone. Sorry, operator. I dropped the phone. These words spoken to a telephone operator are the only clue to the identity of the mysterious woman who shot wealthy Thomas Bedford IV. And for 16 years, those words remain the only evidence, for this crime was never solved. Friends, in just a moment, we will present Miss Jan Cornell, creator and author of This Crime Was Never Solved. But first, a word about the one thing that is never a mystery, the undying popularity of Stanley Cigarettes. Ladies and gentlemen, a sterling character ensures success. A Stanley smoke assures the best. So let's all light up a Stanley, shall we? Mm. It's my pleasure now to introduce the creator and author of The Stanley Show, a very delightful and charming young lady who has probed into more unsolved mysteries than the entire New York City police force. Incidentally, a young lady who is never without a Stanley cigarette. Miss Jan Cornell. Oh. Well, that isn't a family. She won't know the difference. She doesn't smoke. we will again take you back through the years as we recreate another unsolved mystery. One that became famous as Murder at the Crying Pines. Perhaps many of you remember the case of beautiful Lenore Fenwick, whose unfinished autobiography was found beside her lifeless body. The year was 1931. The place, Lenore's isolated retreat in the Catskill Mountains Crying Pines Lodge. The murderer? No one has ever known or dared to answer that question. But next week, ladies and gentlemen, next week I will attempt to answer it. So when you tune in next Friday, you will hear something more than our usual unsolved mystery. You will hear a dramatization of murder at the Crying Pines. And you will also hear my own solution to the strange death of Lenore Fenwick. Good night, everyone. The opinions expressed on this program do not in any way reflect those of the sponsor. Uh, sorry, folks, we're a little late tonight. This is the Alliance Broadcasting Company. You see, none of that was in my script. It wasn't in anybody's script except Jan's. Well, Dan, I... I know, I know. You just ad-libbed a whole new show for next week. Whoever decided that you should be a detective? I did. You did? What right of you to... Look, Dan, if you'll you... just give me a chance, I'll explain everything. That is, if somebody will please take this to Stanley. It's not a Stanley. It's a cigarette. Yeah, well, it's all right, I mean, John. We know what you mean. We've all tried them. Say, Jan, what's with you and this crying pines deal? Smitty, I've got to do something. Look at this. Oh, don't be so grabby. Jan Cornell, who specializes in unsolved mysteries, should try solving one for a change. The mystery of her missing fans. Here's a clue, Jan. Michael Jerome, detective. Same time as yours, but a different station. Well... A.J. A.J., what's that? That? Please, you're speaking of the sponsor we love. Mr. Stanley? Mr. A.J. Stanley. Of course, I don't suppose I should expect A.J. or you to consult me about changing the show. <laughs> no, I'm only the producer of this little fish fry. I didn't even consult A.J. You, you didn't? Oh, 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 suppose we both consult him right now on the telephone. Whistling. What did you call me? <laughs> I hope it's busy. Don, I'd like to do my own explaining to A.J. Jan, uh, will you need me next week? Don't I always have a part for you, Mida? Why, yes, but I thought... Darling, you will have the best part of your career in Murder at the Crying Pines. You see, I want you to play the murdered woman, Lenore Fenwick. Uh, but, Mida, that's swell. Congratulations. 
Boy, oh boy, what a fall I'll have to take for you next week. Oh, Jan, can't you write the script having her killed sitting in a chair? Lynn or Fenwick wasn't... Well, tonight you said the uh, lifeless body was found on the floor. Uh, on the floor, on the ceiling, what's the difference? When A.J. hears about this, we won't even be on the air. Mr. Stanley's calling. It's for Jan. Excuse me, Mr. Fletcher. Hello, A.J. Jan, I just heard the show. Oh, you, you didn't, I, I mean, you don't... Tell him it's your idea. Yes, I thought it was rather dull in spots. But your idea for next week. Yes, A.J.? You deliver the goods next week. You'll have a new contract, a new salary, and a new title for your show. Dan Cornell, detective. How's that? Brother, that's terrific. I'm sorry, AJ, but you know these two party lines. Yes, yes, I, I think the Fenwick murder is perfect for my first experiment. And I'm so glad you like the idea. Indeed, I like it. And Jan, remember, John Fletcher isn't your boss. I am. Good night, dear. Man, want to hear a radio program that costs him ten thousand? You're not an adding machine, Arthur. You're a host. Come along. Eve, don't you even have a wifely interest in my business affairs? If you call that horrid mystery show a business affair, no. And don't expect me to stay here with you and listen to it. Well, the program happens to be from eleven to eleven thirty, so you're quite safe. The show's over for tonight. No, oh, I'll be so glad when it's over for good. What Stanley Cigarettes need is a really fine musical program. Well, don't you think that'd be terribly monotonous? A half hour of nothing but piano? And not even good piano. He could have an orchestra. Oh, excuse me. Am I intruding? No, please come in. I was just leaving. And how was your mystery broadcast tonight, Lady Jane? Well, at least you know when it goes on the air. Oh, certainly. I know everything about my rival. Well, why not, after all? Jane Connell is my rival, and I'm out to get the show away from her. I admire your frankness, Ricky. In fact, I admire it so much that I almost hate to tell you I've just decided to renew Miss Cornell's contract. No. Yes, Jan's popped up with an excellent idea. She's going to attempt solving those unsolved mysteries. To begin with, she's dug up an old scandal that happened at, uh, what's the name of that place? Uh, oh, yes, uh, the Crying Pines, all about the murder of... Uh... Lenore Fenwick. Well, yes, that's the name, Lenore Fenwick. You remember the case? Yes, I, I remember reading about it. But that's not the point, Arthur. Say, uh, isn't Miss Cornell leading with her chin? I mean, um, suppose she makes the wrong guess. Yes, Arthur, she's liable to make a fool out of you. You've got to stop her from doing a thing like that. Stop an idea that's bound to increase the sale of Stanley cigarettes? <laughs> well, then, someone else will have to stop Miss Jan Cornell. Get the car, Ricky. So soon? Well, I gave you a message to deliver tonight, didn't mm -hmm. I? I have it right here. But still early. It won't be in yet. Get the car, Ricky. Thanks. Jan, let's have a cup of coffee at the Three Pirates. All right, but I have to get to work on the new script. Jan. Jan, I can't possibly play Lenore Fenwick. Well, how do you know you can't? You haven't even seen a script. Neither of you. Well, uh, it isn't that. It's the... Uh, uh, well, you remember Thelma Martin? Thelma had an accident. She can scarcely walk. And uh, she's alone at a house in Westport. And I thought if I could go up there for a couple of weeks, I'd, be, I'd take care of her. Uh, yeah, that is, if I weren't in your show next week, I should leave tomorrow morning. Well, of course, Mida. Can you explain to Mr. Fletcher? Certainly. Jen, you're a dear. Good night. Oh, uh, Mida, would you like to join us at the Three Pirates? No. No, I can't. I have an appointment. Goodbye, Jeff. Good night, Mida. 
Who did she say couldn't walk? Thelma Martin. You remember her? I ought to. I saw Thelma this morning on Fifth Avenue, and she was walking. Are you sure? Positive. And furthermore, she doesn't live in Westport. Put that in your script. Oh, well, Mida hasn't been well for several weeks. Well, if it isn't Miss Philo Vance. You mean the thin man's mother. Actors. Uh... Miss Cornell. Tell me, Miss Cornell, who killed her? Well, I know a lot of producers who'd like to. She was a horrible actress. Going to have a part for me next week? Well, she's going to have a show next week, isn't she? <laughs> well, isn't she? You bet she is. Don't let him heckle you, Jane. Well, look who's talking. Yes, Mr. Bill Burton, the head heckler himself. Oh, no, I heard your show tonight, and I think your new idea is swell. Well, you should. You're the cause of it all. Well, you mean my column this afternoon? Yes, your column this afternoon was almost my obituary tonight. Insinuating that corny crime show on WRB is responsible for losing my fans. Of course it is, but you don't have to tell everybody. You know Mike, don't you? No. <laughs> Hello. Sit down, sit down, Jan. Stop worrying. I'll make your crying pine show the biggest, uh, the biggest thing in my column next week. I don't need publicity. I need somebody who remembers the Fenway case. See, how about the files in your office? Say, there's something else she wants to ask you about, Mida Kent. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, one at a time, please. Say, Bill, Mida's acting awfully strange about playing the part of Lenore Fenwick. Oh, she's just a superstitious old actress. Well, that's the first time she's ever refused to play a part since the day you brought her in to me. Bill, how long have you known Mida? One day longer than you. She wanted to be in radio. Some Broadway producer asked me to introduce her to the right people, which I did. I'll kid her about it in my column tomorrow, which I should be writing now. Telephone call for you, Miss Cornell. Uh-oh, A.J.'s changed his mind. Better stick around, Bill. It may be another scoop. It's plugged, dearie. Thanks. Likewise, I'm sure. Uh, it won't reach. I guess you'll have to come over here. Well, uh, so long. Oh, wait, Bill. It might be Lenore Fenwick. Uh, uh. Hello? Oh, hello, Mida. Jen, what I told you on the street a little while ago, I was lying. Yes, I know. Look, honey, I don't want you to get hurt. Well, you will if you don't stop fooling around with that Fenwick case. Why? Tell her she's going to take an awful ribbon if she doesn't play that part. Why, Mida? I can't tell you why over the telephone. No, you'd better make it tonight. Jan, please make it tonight. Right away. 25 West 63rd. All right, Mida, I'll be there. Goodbye. Come on, Smitty, we've got a date on West 63rd. Well, I'd like to drop you, but it's out of my way. Oh, I'll drop you. It's out of your way, too. Only 20 blocks. Oh, come on, let's go. Well, this is it. I hope Mida's still awake. Yes, and I hope you can find your way back to the subway. Good night. Good night. I said good night, Mr. Jerome. Jerome? Yes. You see, things are different in real life. I suppose you expected me to fall over in a dead faint just because I happened to find out you're Michael Jerome, detective. Michael Jerome? Well, how'd you find out? Your voice. Oh, yeah, but we're on the air at the same time. Well, I listen to recordings of all your broadcasts. After all, I want to find out what my competitors got that I haven't. Yeah, well, you won't find that out on record. How about tomorrow? Sorry. I'm always busy on Saturday. I'm free Sunday. Swell, I'll call you Monday. Shh. Cheerful place, isn't it? Cheerful, just like in a cemetery. Well, come on, she said it was the last door on the right. Mm -hmm. That'll wake her up. It ought to wake everybody. Mida. 
Mida. That's a line I use in my show tonight. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to use a line from one of my shows. Let's call the police. We calling the police? Jan Cornell, crime specialist and Michael Jerome, detective calling the police? What would our public say? Never mind what they say. Call the police. Oh, uh, Smitty, give me a nickel. Give her a nickel. Not nervous, are you, Mr. Jerome? I sure am. Somebody must have been in a hurry. Tell the police to bring along a couple of detectives. I'm not calling the police, Smitty. Hello? Hello, Bill. Mighty Kent's just been murdered. <laughs> yes, Jan. I know you want some publicity for that crying fine show, but you don't have to overdo it. Yeah. Yes, I'll get the police there, just as soon as I tell a night editor. The scoop for the Chronicle comes first, you know. All right, Bill, I'll be here. Goodbye. Well, where's our big, brave bodyguard? In the rumpus room. Say, couldn't we just sort of wait for the police out on the front steps? You can. All by myself? Bill! Mr. Jerome, find any clues? Only one. One? Yep. This. Well, that's strange. Well, what's so strange? I don't see any picture. You're not supposed to. Somebody's taken it. Ah! She moved! No, no, she didn't move. She only fell when I... Oh, she just fell. Maybe she got tired of sitting up straight. Oh, how can you say such a thing? Poor Mida. Oh, please don't be afraid. Well, I'm not afraid. Not anymore. Oh, oh, oh if our sponsors could only see us now. Oh. I wouldn't want anyone to see us now. Would you, Smitty? I bet you two could really get romantic in a morgue. Hey, maybe they'll let us sit in the back seat on the way to the station. How much longer are they going to third degree, Miss Cornell? Don't worry about Jan, H.A. She knows all the answers. Oh, does she know who killed Mida Kent? No. Do you? Remember, Mr. Burton, you were in my office tonight as a material witness and not as a reporter of the New York Chronicle. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, Chief Daniels, I... Oh, A.J., I'm sorry. Sorry for what? You didn't murder Mida Kent. Well, maybe I did indirectly. What? Well, Jan feels that her plan to solve the murder of Lenore Fenwick is responsible for Mida's death. I'm sure of it. There was something Mida wanted to tell me. That's why she was killed. Uh, then you won't go ahead with next week's show. Oh, I don't know. I... Well, of course you'll go ahead with next week's show. It's your duty to go ahead with it now. And I'll back you up, Jan. I've just been waiting for a chance to top this defective detective, Michael Jerome, and this is it. Uh, you'll have everyone's cooperation. I'll back you all the way. So will I. Well, that's splendid, young man. I'm A.J. Stanley. I'm Michael Jerome. Uh, Jan, think of the millions of people who'll be waiting to listen in. Think of the millions of potential Stanley smokers. Or, uh, well, that is, uh, I mean, uh... Oh, yes, I, I we all understand, Arthur. 
But I'm sure Miss Cornell wouldn't care to sell cigarettes on such a morbid basis. Would you, Miss Cornell? No. But I did promise to tell my listeners who murdered Lenore Fenwick. And if I do, it would be telling them who murdered Marta Kent, too. Double feature, no less. No, Bill. Single feature. Because they're both chapters of the same story. In other words, the same murder. Exactly. And next week, same time, same station. I'll tell you who it is. I hope. Well, come on, Smitty, let's go home, now, shall wait. we? Now, wait. If you're going to play peekaboo with a murderer the rest of the week, no thanks. I'm going to stay right here. A cell with a bath, please. I'll get you an escort. Oh, Dugan. I don't need an escort. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay right here just long enough to tell Mr. Dugan where I live. It's Plaza 63452. Oh, isn't that silly? That's my phone number. Well, goodbye, everybody. Uh, did you get the number, Dugan? Broadcast. Oh, dear, yes, I can get you all the broadcast tickets you like. Of course, I'm only free after 6 o'clock, but then the better shows are in the evening. Now, what would you like to see? Well, they're not for me. They're for my kids. Kids? Sure. You want to see their pictures? I'd love to. A little darling. Oh, they're not so little. Tim will be 9 next month. And Rosie's almost 8. And then there's Pat, and Don, and George, Mike. Hey, you'd better get some sleep, Bill. Sleep? I've still got that column to write. Well, I'll call us a taxi. Uh, call a taxi for yourself. I'm going with Bill. No, I'm not kidding about that column, Jan. And I write my columns at the Chronicle office. I'm not kidding either. That's where I want to go. I won't be any bother, Bill. All you have to do is turn me loose in that place where you keep pictures and clippings and, and, and old Chronicle files. In the morgue at 3 o'clock in the morning? Well, I've got to start my research on Lenore Fenwick and Mida Kent sometime. Come on. Good night, Mike. It's going to be awfully dark and lonely in that morgue. It won't be if you're there. To help me lift those big, heavy files. <laughs> Night Owl special down here, folks. It's the only one that's automatic. It's reserved for janitors and columnists who are four hours behind the deadline. You kids were in Mighty's room quite a while before the police arrived. Did you find anything? I mean anything that you didn't tell Daniels about. No, only that picture frame. You didn't take that picture, did you, Jane? <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't be here now. I'd be home writing the finish to murder at the crime pub. Because I think the killer got away with a picture of himself. Which way to the morgue, Bill? There it is, right there. Walk right in. It's always open. I'll be upstairs if you need any help. What's the matter, Mike? Lose something? Uh, just some of my boyish illusions. <laughs> the liveliest place for a rendezvous. Who said this was a rendezvous? Well, Smitty made a prediction, remember? She bet we could really get romantic in a morgue. Well, suppose you get busy and help me find the file on Lenore Fenwick. All uh, right, let's see. Oh, weekly report, CDB. Extended case histories, case histories. Jeremy Jepson. Oh, here it is. Jerome. <laughs> You big ham. Find something? Yes. Mike, look. Well? What do you want? Well, just this. Mr. Burton said it would be all right if we... Well, it's empty. Yes. And so is the one on Mida Kent. Bill Burton hadn't any right to send you down here without asking my permission. I'm in charge of this morgue. Oh, well, we're sorry, Mr. Uh... Crunch. Well, Mr. Crunch, may we see the files on... The night editor has them. Oh. Well, then we can go upstairs. You won't find out what you want to know from those files? Why? They're not very complete. That's where you should look. 1931. <laughs> 
that was the year Lenore Fenwick was murdered. And April was the month. Well, why don't you look? May I suggest September? Yeah, but you said she was murdered in April. The trial was in September. Whose trial? The trial of Lenora Fenwick's secretary, Irene Hill, and Mida Kent. So they were friends after all, Mida and Lenore. They got their stuff together in burlesque. Get that September file. What do you want with one of those dusty old files when we have information, please? I just finished researching the case for the night editor. Naturally, I remember a few of the facts. Well, how about telling us some of them? Lenora Fenwick, what a woman. For no reason at all, she decides to settle down in Crying Pines Lodge and write her memoirs. So she takes her secretary, that's Irene Hill, Mata Kent, and $70,000 in cash. Lenora had three husbands. None of them killed her because she killed them first. Indirectly, of course. She just sort of worried them to death. So the jury freed Irene Hill and Mata. According to them, the murder was committed by a mysterious unknown visitor Lenore received that night. Someone who also stole the $70,000. Well, I agree with the jury. But who was the unknown visitor? <laughs> oh, excuse me. This story is so amusing. <laughs> yes, it must be a scream. Well, Mr. Jerome, how about some clues? Mike. Mike, wake up. Call me again in about 10 minutes, will you? Wait a minute. Among the fabulous legends about the past of Lenore Fenwick is one concerning an early marriage. But neither Miss Kent nor Miss Hill could verify the fact. Her first husband. The unknown visitor. The first one? Oh, you wouldn't understand. Come on, let's go home. Oh, good idea. Ugh. Well, good night, and thank you. Hey, good night. Oh. Of course, the most important question is, who was Lenore Fenwick's first husband? Before that, I've got to find out what became of Irene Hill. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, you've been swell. Thanks. Oh. Now, maybe I'd better take you home, huh? Oh, don't be silly. I'm wide awake. Good night. Good night, Mike. Oh, Mike. Dear, Smitty's put the night latch on. Here, step aside. Fix it. Jan? Hey, Smitty, for Pete's sake, put this stuff where it belongs. Oh, it's you. What have you done with Jan? Oh, she's right here. Oh, Smitty, you're not rearranging the furniture again. Rearranging the furniture, my eye. I did that for my own protection. Since this was slipped under my door tonight. Miss Cornell, you are now what is known in your radio scripts as a marked woman. You didn't meet Mida Kent tonight, but if you don't mind your own business, you will. Well, from what I've just read about Midas past, it would be a very warm place to meet. 
Take a look at this note that you lifted from the pet boy. Where's well, the same stationery? It is impossible for me to give you more than this tonight. But if you can stop the broadcast, you'll have everything you want. I. I. Somebody's initial. Well, obviously, but whose? Irene begins with an I. Irene? Yes, Irene. As in Irene Hill. Oh, hello, Don. I was just asking Smitty when I could expect the script for Murder at Crying Pines. Smitty doesn't write my show. And you don't answer your telephone. I've been very busy writing. Well, where's the script? Don't worry, Don. You'll get it. When? Just as soon as I decide who murdered Lenore Fenwick and Mida Kent. Well, new sound effects for my show? No, it's Uncle Don's bedtime stories. Tonight he's telling kiddies all about a man who gets his head bashed in with a nice, dull meat axe. Well, what about the sound effects for Crying Pines? Are you kidding? No, I mean, I want a very unusual sound effect. The sound of pines crying in the wind. Huh? Yes. Most of the action will take place at Crying Pines Lodge. So make those trees sound good and gory. Why can't you be like other authors and write about pines that sigh? I've got a lot of sighing pines, whispering ones, too. Here, take a pick. In one of those old newspapers I read, a reporter said the night Lenore Fenwick was murdered, those pine trees sounded like a chorus of crying women. Now, where am I going to get a recording of pine trees that sound like that? We're going to make one, tonight, at Crying Pines Lodge. Well, of course. Why didn't I think of it? Hey, what am I saying? Try to get the right one. You know the old saying, if at first you don't succeed. Well, come on, let, let's get to work. Let's don't. Let's, let's go home. Go home? We just got here. I know, but... But, hey, wait for me. until a wind comes up and makes them cry. A wind? Yes, dear, a wind. Hey, Jan, that reminds me of something I forgot to tell you. Something I read in a weather forecast in this morning's paper. The weatherman said there isn't going to be any wind in this part of New York State for several weeks. He didn't say why. He just said something to do with elements and things like that. So as long as the elements are in that condition, well, there's just no use waiting for a wind. We can just... Jan, what's that? That, Smitty, is the wind. The wind and what else? The pine trees. The crying, Smitty. Listen. It's just like music, isn't it? It's the kind they play at funerals. Well, hurry up. Turn it out. We've got to make a record of that before the wind stops. A and bring my flashlight. They put it close to the tree so it'll pick up the sound. Hey, you're not going in. Why not? I've been writing about this place for days. 
I'd like to see what it really looks like. The door's locked. How do you know it's locked? You didn't even try it. Oh, my goodness, after all these years, it ought to be. back to New York. Oh, Smitty, please, what if we get back to the studio and find we've made a bad record? There, you see? No, wait, I want to hear all of it. Why don't you stop trying to solve the murder of Lenore Fenwick? You might find the right answer, but will you live to tell it? Well, don't look at me. It, it came out of there. I know, but... Don Fletcher. A trick like this would be his idea of a very funny gag. Yeah, but Don isn't here. He hasn't the nerve to come here. In any way, it could be done at the studio. I'll try another one to find out. No, please, Jen, let's go. Me better with this hole in my head? Come on, let's go home. Wait a minute, I don't want to go home. That's because you don't know what somebody just said on that record. Maybe he does. What? Oh, Jan, Mike wouldn't do a thing like that, would you, Mike? Why, of course, I do a thing like what? We'll tell you all about it when we get home. All about what? What's happening? Why is she homesick all of a sudden? Mike, how long have you been here? Why, I just, just a few minutes. I parked my car down the road, walked up to the lodge, and up the steps. As I was saying, I... As I was, uh, Look, that was an echo of this door slamming, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. You wait here, both of you. Mike, wait. Here, give me that flashlight. I'm scared of the dark. Every time we do a haunted house script, my author gives me a lot of candles, so I brought one along here. Just close our eyes and think about a lot of people. 
people dancing in cafes and walking up and down Broadway at high noon and, and traffic cops all over the place and... Jan! Jan! What's the matter? There's just the two of us here, aren't there? Well, what about Mike? That isn't Mike. Get out of here. <gasps> Lenore Fenwick's ghost. Shut up. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Cornell. I didn't come here to kill you. Oh, Mike! But I'm tempted to take a shot at your loudmouthed friend. Now, Miss Cornell. Miss Cornell! Yes? Because of you, someone killed Mida Kent. And if you continue your snooping, she won't be the only one to die. I'll be next. Why? I, I don't know who you are, but why should anyone want to kill you? You'd better worry about your own life, Miss Cornell. If it isn't too late. There's been so much publicity, and now the police. Why didn't you stop that first night when I tried to warn you? Warn you? Then you're the one who wrote that note. Yes. Yes, I am. And now, will you get out of here? Irene Hill. What did you say? You're Irene Hill. I know you are. But you needn't be afraid. You didn't kill Lenore Fenwick. You said when you wrote that note, you were trying to help me. Well, we can't stop now. Please, please tell me who... <laughs> Let me out of here. Now, what's the idea of locking me? Uh-oh, somebody else must have been murdered. The only time I ever get a tumble from Jan is when somebody's been bumped off. You ain't kidding, brother. What? She's right, Mike. This time it's Irene Hill. Irene Hill? The craziest thing happened. She was pointing a gun at us, and it must have backfired. It didn't backfire, Mike. There's someone else in that room. Well, wait, said we all kind of sort of go on home. There's a door over there. Did you say Irene Hill? Well, of course it's Irene Hill. She stood right here and said she wrote that note. And... Eve Stanley, her sponsor's wife. Honey, I'd sure hate to be your next option. Mrs. Stanley, who used to be Irene Hill. All right, now, baby, take it easy. She was. I know she was, and I can prove it. Everything she said is on that record. What record? Mike, what am I going to do now? Well, personally, I like Smitty's suggestion. Let's kind of sort it of all, huh? Yes, I knew her as Eve Bennett, who we met for the first time eight weeks before our marriage. That was five years ago. Five years ago tomorrow, to be exact. Mrs. Stanley was always very vague regarding her past. All her personal effects are at your disposal, but I doubt very much if you can do a better job of searching than I did. I found nothing to indicate she was ever known as Irene Hill. But what she said to me about the note, doesn't that prove she was? Yes, and so did the record. Mr. Jerome, I'm asking you for the last time. Did you ever see or hear that record? None of us heard that record. We've told you that. How could we when it's been stolen? But I heard Mrs. Stanley in person. It creeps just thinking about it. Please, Miss Smith, not again. Chief Daniels, don't keep me in suspense any longer. Are you going to stop my broadcast? I should think you'd want it stopped if you can't name the murderer. And even if you could, in view of Mrs. Stanley's death, well, I think broadcasting it would be in very bad taste. Pleasure. I'm sorry. But this is hardly a matter of taste. 
More than anyone else, I am responsible for what happened. After all, I encouraged Miss Cornell to become a detective. And I'm not going to stop encouraging her now. As a tribute to my late wife, there will be no mention of Stanley cigarettes on the Crying Pines broadcast. Don't be surprised at my ruthlessness, Jan. Eve Stanley, or Irene Hill, as you prefer to call her, was a ruthless woman. Frankly, I think she deserved the fate she met at Crying Pines. And now, Chief Daniels, with your permission, I'm a slave. We are due at the broadcasting station. Come along, Fletcher. There were so many questions regarding Mrs. Stanley that I could not answer. But there is someone should be able to answer them for you. I hope you can find Ricky Moreno. Ricky Moreno? Isn't he the orchestra leader? Oh, you're thinking of Ricky Moreno. That's what Mr. Stanley said, Ricky Moreno. Oh, I'm sorry, but you misunderstood. He said Nicky Barino. Nicky Barino? Well, I heard him say. Yeah, Chief, I'm afraid Jan is right. Mr. Stanley said Nicky Barino. Well, I thought he said Mickey Farina. Nicky Barino. Uh, that's what I said. I mean, that's. Uh, what... Nicky Barino. Have my car brought around. And get me the address of Ricky Marino. Make yourselves right at home. Stay as long as you like. There goes my chance to question Ricky. Well, you could take another chance. Go on, Jan, try it. Your car's right outside. Well, what about Daniels? Oh, I think he could be delayed, don't you, Smitty? Oh, boy, could he? Miss Cornell, this is indeed a pleasant surprise. I was expecting the police. Oh, well, Chief Daniels has been delayed, I hope. What's this? $500 in cash. As you know, Mr. Stanley pays me for writing a radio program. And I'm in the habit of paying everyone who contributes to that program. Uh -huh. And my contribution? Mr. Marino, did... Uh, Eve Stanley ever tell you anything about Lenore Fenwick's first husband? Miss Cornell, I don't know the answer to your $500 question. I see. Perhaps uh, five of the $100 ones. Well, I could try, won't you, Sid? Thank you. Did you know Eve Stanley when she was Irene Hill? No. For some unknown reason, I never get to know women until after they are married. You know, until last night, I don't think anyone except Maida Kent knew Eve's true identity. Well, what about the murderer? You almost found him last night at the Crying Pines, didn't you? Did you ever deliver an envelope to Maida Kent? <laughs> many of them. So many of them, in fact, that I became curious. Of course, there's no use asking Eve for an explanation. But I thought uh, Maida looked the type who would talk after a few drinks. And she did. That's how I found out what actually happened at the Crying Pines the night of Leno Fenwick's murder. Yes? Well, they were both in their rooms. I mean, uh, Maida and Eve. Well, let's call her Irene. They heard a shot. And they rushed downstairs and found Leno dead. And? And uh, I'm afraid I should have to consider that question number four. Please continue, Mr. Marino. All right. Well... Maida went to call the police, and when she came back, she saw Irene taking something out from behind the loose brick in the fireplace. The uh, $70,000. Yes. And she hid the money somewhere in the lodge and uh, promised to meet Maida a year later at the Crying Pines to divide the money. Maida Kent, she kept her promise, but Irene Hill, she didn't. It was first years later that Maida found out who uh, Mrs. A.J. Stanley really was. And then she went to collect. However, the $70,000 is gone. Eva spent it for a lease and a new life. So, Maida settled for less on the installment plan. Yes, her so. I'm sorry that uh, our visit wasn't more beneficial, I mean, for you. Well, perhaps it will be. I'm entitled to one more question. Go right ahead. 
What became of the last installment uh, you delivered to Mata Kent? I didn't deliver it, after all. What good is money to someone already dead? Excuse me. Oh, geez. Come on, I'm sorry, baby. I did my best to delay him. So did I. Take charge of Miss Cornell. Oh, wait a minute. You can't arrest her. I don't intend to arrest her. I just want to make sure that she gets home safely. And when she does, I want a police guard to see that she stays there until it's time for her broadcast tonight. Wait a minute. Who are you? Oh, hello. You're new here, aren't you? I'm the night shift. Well, I'm the swing shift. Fine. And swing into that apartment and stay there. Hello, Smitty. Say, what goes on here? Where do you think you're going? Oh, I have to get to the rehearsal with our escort. Rehearsal? Jan, have you got a finish? Yes. Yes, a sensational finish. Ladies and gentlemen, so you'd like to know who the murderer is? Well, so would I. And please, Smitty, not too much sound effects on my exit. Just a gentle thud. Cheer up, kid. I'll give you a four-star review. I wish somebody would give me another week to find Madam Fenwick's first husband. Hello? Yes? Who? Oh, yes, Mr. Crunch. Uh, Miss Cornell, there's something you should know. Something I've been afraid to tell you. You see, I haven't delivered 25 West 63rd. Well, I, I don't understand. And that night, her radio was playing very loudly, and I went to complain. I turned the radio off. At first, I thought she was asleep at the desk. And then, then I saw the picture. I took it. Mida Kent and Lenore are in the picture, and there's someone else. A man. Who is it? I'm afraid. I'll, I'll leave the picture in the Fenwick file here in the morgue. Please don't tell anyone. And if you come... I'd advise you to come alone. Bye. Oh, just an old friend wishing me luck. I'll be ready just as soon as I get my script. Hey, what's this? Oh, uh, that's the wrong script. <laughs> Put her on, will you? Put her on what? She's gone. She tricked us to get out. We can't find her. We've got Bill Burton looking for her and the cops and Chief Daniels. Hey, wait a minute. I just remembered something. Did somebody called by the name of Mr. Crunch. If that means anything. If that means anything, it certainly does. It means we'll probably find her in the morgue. Already? Oh, no, Mike. Please, oh, no. Hello? Hello?
you take me to the studio. I've got to finish for the show. Oh, but honey, what about you? Are you all right? All right. I feel wonderful. I feel terrific. Mike, I feel... Now, remember, Smitty, that sound on page four is a telephone, not a shot. Sorry, I'm a little nervous tonight. I keep reaching for guns. I have rehearsed without a last page. Now I've got to have one for rough timing. But, Don, there is no last page. It's strictly ad lib. I don't care what it is. I've got to have some reason. All right, Fletcher. Of course, uh, it may be a good idea if you let someone know what you intend to say. But I was only thinking of your own safety. Naturally, after tonight, I'd want to put you under contract for the rest of your life. Mike, look at the time. What about your broadcast at WBR? Oh, I told my former producer to get an understudy tonight. Your former producer? Yeah, and he said he'd love to get an understudy for the rest of the season. But, Mike, you can't... I brought you a special guest. Oh, thanks. The show wouldn't have been complete without them. Oh, boy. As soon as the show goes on the air, you go off that payphone just outside the door. Call the Chronicle City Desk. Keep the wire open until you hear from me. There's a nickel for the call. Yes, sir. And, boy, this uh, is for your time. Yes, sir. Where do you want this, Jan? Oh, just put it here, Ralph. I'm using the table mic tonight. Okay. Well, I thought you'd be at the Chronicle writing my obituary. Well, that's all set up in type. I just stopped in for a first-hand scoop on the gory details. Mm -hmm. Jan? Yes? Boy, what an audience we'll have tonight. Ralph tells me they're lined up for block. But Mr. Fletcher says they gotta stay outside. On account of the killer, he might sneak in that way. He's already in. Quiet, everybody. Quiet. Everybody, please leave the stage, with the exception of the press and those directly concerned with this broadcast. Anybody go in? No. Nobody in or out. The broadcast will be over in three minutes. It's about time for that mastermind to tell us how to solve a crime. The elevator descended slowly, bringing Jan Cornell closer and closer to the first floor. Finally, it stopped. The door slid open, and then... Mike! Jan, are you all right? Of course I'm all right, Mike, but hurry. You've got to take me to the studio. I've got to finish for the show. You, you've just heard a dramatization of the story of Lenore Fenwick's murder at the Crying Pines and the deaths which followed in its wake when Jan Cornell decided to solve the mystery. And now comes the real-life climax to this stirring real-life drama, the moment you've all been waiting for. I present the young lady who has given this program a new title. This crime was solved. Miss Jan Cornell. Good evening. In the drama you just heard, every character was called by his or her true name, with one exception. The one I call simply Mr. X. Mr. X, as you now know, is the former partner of Lenore Fenwick and Mida Kent in burlesque. It was his love for Lenore which proved to be his downfall. For Lenore's evil mind created a swindle which the adoring Mr. X performed. The swindle was successful for Lenore, but it sent Mr. X to prison. And Lenore forgot him until years later at Crying Pines. Tonight, Mr. X makes another unexpected appearance. It is now my duty to introduce him. It is not a pleasant duty because I'm about to introduce a friend as a murderer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. X is... Mr. X is... He is... The murderer is... Jam! Stand back, all of you. She needs air. Air, it's too late for air. She's dead. He's killed her. The water. It's been poisoned. Oh, no, Bill. That's not the cup you poisoned. Smitty, you did change it, didn't you? You bet. This cup's exhibit A. <laughs> Mr. Burton, the city out of the water. Ladies and gentlemen, the murderer, Bill Burton, has just tried to escape. Correction. The murderer has just been subdued by Michael Jerome Detective. This is Jan Cornell saying good night until next week. No, no, you can't do that. We still got 60 seconds to go. 60 well, seconds. 60 huh? seconds. Well, time this, brother. Uh, thanks.
This is the Alive Broadcasting Company.